Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I'm your co-host, Chris Seveny, and today I have a special guest, uh, Joe Kennedy from Flying Moose Investments. Joe, how are you doing today? Doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. No problem. So what I wanted to do is I asked several other investors out there uh, to, if they wanted to be guests on the show, to share their stories. Uh, you know, we've done over 100 episodes on our podcast and have had numerous guests, but we also wanted to kind of, you know, bring in some other individuals to talk about their experiences because you can always learn from hearing short stories. So uh, over the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing some stories from some other investors. And today I've got Joe on. So Joe, why don't you introduce yourself? And we've got PowerPoint for those who are watching uh, this on YouTube or other channels. Or if you're listening, um, you can go on to our YouTube channel to download uh, the slides later on. Great. Well, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, um, the name of my company is called The Flying Moose. And uh, I always get the question, where'd you come up with that name? You know, it's kind of a unique, weird name. And um, it's a, w when I was looking to set it up, I was wanting something unusual, something kind of memorable that, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of, you know, ABC capital or that those typical type stuff. And so I wanted something that, you know, Hey, I've heard of that one before type thing. Mm -hmm. um, and where, you know, so uh, where'd you get the name? And uh, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, my wife is a petite lady. And uh, so when I'm in the kitchen with her and I happen to be in her way while she's trying to cook or whatever, she always calls me a moose, you know, get out of my way, you moose mm -hmm. type thing. And then uh, one of my hobbies is, uh, is flying. I'm a private pilot. So it just kind of seemed logical to be the flying moose. So that's the way I ended up naming the company. So I'm um, curious because I'm afraid I hate flying. Uh, first oh. off, I'm curious. You know, what type of planes do you fly and uh, how often do you fly? Yeah, I am. Um, well, not a lot lately with the uh, <laughs> coronavirus going on, but uh, I, uh, I'm a private pilot for single engine planes. So I fly the little ones. We call them the guys that go mm -hmm. bust holes in clouds and that kind of stuff, you know, and you fly kind of locally. I don't, you know, it's not like I fly all across the United States all the time. You know, I, I fly pretty much local to the area, but I just enjoy getting up and, you know, being able to go and see different things, you know, from the air and, and I'm just kind of having the freedom to do that. So, uh, you know, there's a, a number of different planes um, that I fly, you know, Cessna 172 is a pretty common one. It's just a small single engine and some Piper. Um, I guess the, the one big thing, one opportunity I had was uh, I have, happened to have an opportunity to be a, a co-pilot um, in uh, a Russian uh, uh, jet fighter. Uh, they had an opportunity when I was in Russia to, to be able to go fly uh, a MiG. And so uh, the, I guess the, the accomplishment there was I was, was able to break the sound barrier flying around in this Russian MiG. Um, did you do the Tom Cruise where you inverted and got right above another one? You know, from I didn't, well, we weren't close to another one, but I did un do an inversion. I did do loops. Uh, and we had a, a stall where you just go straight up until the, the, the thing stalls and then it kind of falls back and then you recover and, and fly on. And so, uh, that was a lot of fun. That was, that was a lot of fun, but the, the, um, breaking the sound barrier was kind of a non-event really. All you do is you look at the airspeed indicator and it says, okay, you know, you're now going faster than the speed of sound. Whereas, you know, if you're down on the ground, you hear this yeah. type thing, you know? So uh, anyway, it was, it was cool. It was a nice, nice experience, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's not something I fly every day. So one of the question is, you know, you mentioned about flying local. What is local for you for all the listeners? Where are you local? Oh yeah. I'm, I'm based in Houston. So my local is, Texas, Louisiana, that kind of stuff. Yeah, small state of Texas. So. Yeah, the small state. You know, we, you know, once we get out of Texas, it's quick to get anywhere else. You know, it's just getting out of Texas is the problem. So, <laughs> so anyway, that's kind of kind of what I do for fun. Um, kind of a little bit about me, what I, what I've done, and uh, how I kind of got to where I am today. I spent twenty years in a corporate finance job. Um, my, uh, the last five years of my career in, in corporate finance, I was a CFO for a joint venture in Russia with a major oil company. Um, 
And during that time, of course, I was doing personal investments and I did a lot of investments like a lot of people in stocks and bonds. And mm -hmm. over time, I started kind of moving out of those because I don't know, it was, you know, I, I didn't have a magic crystal ball. You mm -hmm. know, I was like anybody else looking at all the stuff. And, and so the kind of returns weren't, they weren't great. You know, they were okay. And sometimes you lose money and it was just completely unpredictable. So I started moving out of, out of that into real estate and uh, I got into some rentals, uh, which wasn't bad. Uh, but then I kind of heard about notes and I uh, started investing in, investigating about notes and how they work and all that kind of stuff and went to some trainings and you and I even, you know, attended some different events together. Yeah. Um, and I got really interested in them. And so uh, I actually started investing personally in notes. Um, I'm, I'm a little guy in the note world. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I guess my philosophy, you know, a lot of the people teach you, Hey man, if you want to really make notes, you need to get other people's money in there and get put it to work and you can make some money. And, and I, I don't deny that. I mean, a lot of people have done that and, and, and they've done it well. Uh, but for me, I guess, because I'm a little older and, uh, I just am kind of at that point where if I take anybody else's money, I want to be really confident with my knowledge and understanding of investing before I put anybody else's money at risk. So I've kind of started out doing the stuff, you know, based on my personal investments in order to get that experience and learning so that then I'm comfortable with bringing somebody else in. And so that's kind of the way I've started and kind of, kind of where, where I am and where I'm going. And that's, I mean, that is so critical that um, I'm glad you mentioned that is you know, you're using your own funds to buy, to educate yourself, because, you know, as we go through this, one of the questions I was going to ask you at the end is, you know, from your education to buying a note, you know, the learning curve of how much you learn from the education versus the, the actual physical buying, which, um, you know, for us who've done it, know the answer, but I'd like for you to, you know, answer that later on. And, you know, that's one of the things is, you know, making sure you know what you're doing before you take someone else's money. And even if you think you know what you're doing, um, a lot of times you may not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yes. I'm glad you brought that up and I'm glad uh, you, you followed that path. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you said you wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, my first note and my experience. And so I put together a little information um, as I've kind of gone down this path, I guess the, the, the three biggest challenges that I've, I've found is that, you know, finding good assets to purchase, um, you know, I've seen a lot of garbage out there that people are selling. Um, and, you know, sometimes you, it, it, it gets very tiring going through all of these things that are just, uh, you know, um, so it, it takes a lot of work and you need to work to try to find people who have some good stuff, build relationships with different people, you know, that uh, really make it beneficial to, to move forward you know the other is you know understanding how much you should pay for it you know kind of that's that's key you you pay too much and you're not going to make very much um and there's all uh -huh. kinds of things around the corner that you're not expecting that can happen you know um and then the last part is you know you find the right service providers because there are some that are good and some that aren't so good and some that are expensive and some that you know are more reasonably priced and some can deliver and some really don't deliver so well. So, you know, that's kind of, that's kind of a learning experience that you don't get going to, you know, some of these seminars and different stuff is, you know, you either hear it from other investors or, you know, you learn it yourself that you're not really getting what you're hoping to get from a particular service provider. Mm -hmm. So, um, and these, these problems that you mentioned are yeah. consistent going to be this. I mean, I'll tell people, you know, I've been doing this, you know, for a short time, you know, but still been four years and those are constant problems. <laughs> that you're gonna you do not grow them, do you? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to tell you about my first deal, my first deal uh, was in Escanaba, Michigan. And Escanaba is on the upper peninsula of Michigan and it's, a city of about 12,000. So it's not a really big place. So I got a tape and I have listed here the details on the tape. They said the origination date of the note was April 15th, 2015. Original note was 32.3. 
the UPB was 31, 736, 9.9 .9 interest rate, P and I 281, and they had last paid in September of 2017. It's a single family. Was it, it was owner occupied, it's built in the 1900s, and the Zillow fair market value is 72,809. So this was one that, you know, looking at it, you know, at the time, May of 2018, they were only eight months behind. Um, right. You know, so right. That's not, that's not too bad. No, it's not too bad. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, my, I first started out really focusing on non-performing because uh, my intention really was to try to work with people to try to get them to reperform. Because if you could get it at a decent price, you get it reperforming, then it's kind of a win-win, you know, it's, for the, the homeowner, because, you know, everybody knows life happens, you know, people have loose jobs, they have medical issues, whatever. And so if you can kind of get them through that and back on track, you can turn around and sell the note as a performer after you've got it seasoned and, you know, you get a decent return and, you know, everybody's kind of happy. Yep. So, so I started my due diligence and I found out, well, no, it's not owner occupied. The property was vacant. And the fair market value was somewhere between 26,000 and 31,000, not the 72,000 that was shown on the tape. Mm -hmm. There was a, the, it was a contract for deed, but it was unrecorded okay. and the taxes were current. So that was the good news. <laughs> so, uh, so, the, so it was a CFD, yeah. uh, Michigan, uh, basically, you know, Borrower was eight months, but the borrower left the property. Um, right. And so when you did your due diligence, you know, so you ordered a title report, it looks like, and you also put eyes on the property, which are two important things everybody should do. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Okay. Yep. So I ended up purchasing the note for 12.2. So we had a UPB of about 32 and I got it for 12 too. So I got it for 38% of UPB. I was pretty happy. I thought that was good. Yeah. No, also I, kind of, huh? I mean, at that price point, you know, you're probably usually at, you know, anywhere from 30 to 40%. So yeah, no, that's a, you know, yeah. when you look at the difference of, you know, between 30 and 38% on something like that, it's not, I mean, you're talking probably less than a thousand bucks. Um, you know, from right. that yeah. So. So I, and I estimated that the, uh, the market price was probably around 26.8, somewhere in there. Um, and I had cranked into my, my model of a foreclosure expense, expense of 60, about 6,300 bucks. Mm -hmm. So probably heavy and, you know, I would, you know, think off the yeah. top of my head, but you know, it's, you're, you're always better to be heavy than you are light. <laughs> and and I, I agree, you know, a lot of people are more closer to five or, anywhere from three to five. Yeah. I, you're right. I tend to be more on the heavy side. I guess I'm, you know, trying to, to build kind of a worst case scenario, if you will, rather than, mm -hmm. you know, it's all roses. So I looked at the exit options, you know, of course, obviously foreclosure was an exit option. Deed and lose was an exit option and, and reperforming. Well, it's an option, you know, it's vacant and uh, they hadn't been able to contact the, the borrower. Mm -hmm. So, I went through and there's the, the, the profits that I came up with. The foreclosure is about $2,900, 16% ROI. Deed and Lude, $7,300. That was a really good one. If I could get that to happen, you know, that's 51% or, or re-performing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's the best one of them all. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was looking at as I was going into this to see, you know, how's it going to play out. Mm -hmm. So what happened? Well, I got connected with a good realtor. I was fortunate and it was, it was luck more than anything. Uh, That's pretty good being out in the middle of nowhere, Michigan to get a good realtor. So. Exactly. And this lady, she was fantastic to work with um, and she was on top of it. I got the loan boarded with a servicer um, mm -hmm. and I hired a loss mitigation service to start looking for the borrower. You know, we need to find out what's going on. So, um, so you didn't use the service or used a third party? I used a third party. Okay. Yeah. Um, and since it was vacant, mm -hmm. um, unoccupied, we had the locks changed and I put forced placed insurance on the property. Mark move there. Good move. So the realtor then sent me pictures and mm -hmm. there was a whole lot of stuff still in the house. You know, mm -hmm. it was kind of weird. It said, you know, kind of needs to be cleaned out. So that's something we had to work with. And 
there was uh, two names, co-borrowers on the note, and uh, they were actually found one. The, the co-borrowers, it turned out, it was a mother and a son, and the son was the one that had lived in the house, and he had passed away. He was single, apparently didn't have any family, and the mother was in a senior living facility. Okay. So it was just, I mean, it was just gone. Mm -hmm. So um, we were able to get in contact with the mom, and she said, yes, I don't want the house. I've been trying to get in touch with somebody, you know, to get rid of it. She said, you know, she didn't have any need for it and she was getting stuff. And so uh, we said, hey, how about a deed and loo? I said, you know, we'll give you 1500 bucks if you send somebody in to clean it out and, you know, sign all the paperwork that, you know, you release all your claims on it, et cetera. Mm -hmm. She said, you bet, that sounds great. So, um, now we're getting close to a little before October, so we had to winterize the house. Yep. That, that's not something we think a lot of about here in Texas, but anyway, <laughs> up there, we, so we had it winterized. Mm -hmm. And then I get a call from the realtor said, hey, Joe, I'm sorry, but uh, there's a leak in the house. Um, and uh, you know, we need to kind of get it looked at. She said, I know a roofer. She said, uh, I can have him come over later today and just put a tarp over it to protect it. Um, and so we see what you want to do and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He came over. So he took a look at it. He put a tarp on it and mm -hmm. we could replace part of the roof that was affected, uh, which we did. And uh, so we got that taken care of. And so finally, on September, mm -hmm. the end of September, we got it listed for 29.5 and I was offering owner financing as an option. Yeah, so that was four months. That's actually pretty quick, um, in my mind. You know, when I look at getting from buying a loan, getting it boarded, trying to hunt somebody down, um, getting the deed in lieu, and getting on market in four months, I, I would say I, I'd call that a win, personally. Okay. Okay. Well, so the problem is the the, the problem is timing because this is now the early October <laughs> in a small town in Northern Michigan and you know, the snow hits and nothing much is going on basically from November to the following February. I mean, winter's there and mm -hmm. that, nothing happens. And so me. I get to pay taxes for the, the prior year. And then finally, I ended up selling it to an investor in June mm -hmm. for 21.5. Now, did you sell it cash or did you finance it to the investor? Uh, at that price, I sold it cash. Okay. So, mm -hmm. what are the numbers? So, I purchased it in May 15th of 18. Purchase price was 12.2. We changed the locks, did the skip tracing, forced place insurance, the legal fees for the deed in lieu, the actual deed in lieu payment servicer fees, winterizing, property management, roof repair, and city fees and taxes, all total 5,300 bucks. Mm -hmm. So my all-in investment in this property was 17.5. Mm -hmm. Now it's interesting, because um, I'll note, you know, some people will be like, oh, deed and lose is gonna be, you know, cheaper than foreclosure, which, you know, usually is. Um, mm -hmm. But even with a deed and lieu, I mean, you know, with these properties, um, and what needs to typically be done, you know, a lot of people will just plug in five to 10,000 in costs that you're going to spend and kind of look at the numbers here, take out the deed in lieu. You know, you still spent close to 4,000 bucks on the property and yeah. you really didn't do anything, correct? Yeah, exactly. So, nope. Yeah, that's something I think a lot of people, especially on these low valued assets on a $100,000 property, of course, you have a lot more wiggle room, but on some of these twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 properties, some people think when they do these calculations, okay, you know, I'm going to have a servicer for six months at, you know, 500 bucks in servicing and, you know, the properties, the BPO came back at 30,000, I'm going to sell it for 30. It's like, no, you're probably going to sell it for 20 to 25, plus you're going to put five into it. So, you know, and this is perfect example kind of what, what you showed here. Right, right. So mm -hmm. what's the final economics on it? Mm -hmm. Well, I had $17,510 $17, invested, mm -hmm. sold it for twenty-one five, but then I had to pay taxes, mm -hmm. the legal fees of the closing, 
mm -hmm. title insurance, and the commission. So my net proceeds from the sale were eighteen four seventy five, which means I made nine hundred and sixty five dollars on the note, which is a return of six percent. So, and and again, this was a deed in lieu that you got it thirty eight cents on the dollar. Um, right. So you know, I see sometimes people or sellers wanting fifty fifty five cents on the dollar on some of these things, which you know, in this instance. Um, you know, that would have been roughly, you would have been in for about 17,000 just for your acquisition, um, you know, plus the 5,000, 22 minus it, you would have lost about three, $4,000 on that deal. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So um, that was, it was good. I didn't, I mean, I didn't lose money. As you know, but on the first deal, if you, you know, for me, yeah. I look at, you know, getting started and buying my first, my first, go around i bought i think like three or four notes at once where i bought like a performer a non-performer one in bk and you know my whole goal was between all of them if i broke even i'd be happy um mm -hmm. you know and it was doing it more for the education honestly and you know because it's, you know some people pay you know tens of thousands of dollars for these educations whereas hey look i'd rather drop twenty thousand thirty thousand on a few low balance notes and kind of get the uh, education yeah. higher um from that perspective Right, right. So that's kind of how the first one went. You know, I, I, I felt pretty good about it, uh, other than the, the return, obviously. But so, you know, kind of what, what did I learn? Um, well, do your due diligence and make sure you understand the market. Um, I, didn't, I didn't really quite get this one right. I, I think that I overpriced it, even, even though, you know, it was, um, a lot lower than what it said on the, on the original tape. Um, you know, you need to get a good, a good value of it. And, and, um, that's going to be key. Knowing your service providers and their strengths. I learned a lot about some of the service providers because I hired a loss mitigation firm, mm -hmm. spent two months with them and they never found the co-borrower. But you can say who it is if you want. I have no, you know, it's up to you, but so. You can refrain. Yeah. Not to. <laughs> I, I, uh, uh, but what was funny was that the loan servicer found them. Yeah, that's usually, it's usually the opposite. Uh, I know, I know. Um, so they found them. Uh, so I kind of lost two months basically just looking for the borrower, you know, which was this mom that was in a, you know, a senior living facility. Um, mm -hmm. So once we found them and she agreed to do a deed and lieu, I talked to the servicer. I said, Hey, can you do the deed and lieu? Mm -hmm. Mistake. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Cause they were charged. They're going to charge me, I don't know, 350 bucks or something to do it. And uh, three weeks after I'd asked them to do it, they came back and asked me for more information. And I said, excuse me. <laughs> I've found nothing been to it. You know, nothing against servicers, but anytime it comes to like loan modifications or deed and lose, it's very difficult because you know the process just takes so long and you lose so much time. It's you're better off dealing directly with them because sometimes the borrower gets the deed and lieu and they don't understand it and they ask a question, and the servicer takes you know, a week to send you say, Hey, this is a question. Are you okay? Me answering it. And it's like, okay, I could have just picked up my phone and then, you know, five minutes got it resolved where you lost two weeks right then and there. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, so I got so frustrated. I, I, uh, picked up the phone and I called Satelli and Borelli, you know, yeah. and, uh, they said, well, yeah, send me the stuff. You know, if it's all there, I'll have it to you tomorrow morning. I went, what? <laughs> Go, yeah. And it was like a third the price. I mean, I have a lot of good things to say for those guys. I mean, they've, they've, they've been really good for all of my interactions. Good. So um, I learned time is money. I mean, part of my problem was you said it was pretty quick. And I guess relatively speaking, it was. But... If I could have had maybe two of those months back, mm -hmm. I might have been able to sell it that year. But yeah. because of the location of where it was in Upper Michigan, and mm -hmm. we were just starting to go into winter, mm -hmm. you know, 
my opportunity to sell it diminished significantly. If I had gotten it, if I could have got it on the market in August, I might have had a better chance of getting it sold. So kind of, you know, time is money. You need to kind of keep things going and, and uh, you know, as it takes longer, you're, you're paying the taxes on it till you finally get it sold. So. Well, you're paying the taxes. I mean, if you're mowing, you know, certain places, you may have to be mowing the lawn. Um, oh yeah. I had city, it's, you know, that's city that's fees for that. You know, and again, on these lower value, I mean, you pay twelve thousand dollars. You know, twelve hundred bucks um, in expenses is ten percent of your cost. So That's right. That's your, right. Numbers, your returns can fluctuate significantly. That's why on some of these lower dollar ones, sometimes you're better off looking at. You know, it's not as much to return because the difference between ten and fifteen percent is only five six hundred bucks. Which you're better off, I think, looking at the number of okay, I made this um, because I think it's. Uh, you know, um, you know, something that's, you know, more relatable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then, you know, um, you have to realize or appreciate that if you're dealing with a property in a small town, you know, the, the time it may take you to sell, it's going to be longer than if you're a bigger, in a bigger metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Cause there's just not the quantity of buyers that, that there are so um those were those were all some some good learnings um and i think a lot of it really goes back to number one which is do your due diligence uh, in general um and i can't overemphasize that enough because if you don't get that right you know then you're you're gonna have a lot of problems later so a few questions i had is um so you bought the loan. Did you keep it with the same servicer that was servicing it originally? Uh, no, I, I moved it. Uh, when I bought it, I moved it to Madison. So that I had that window of time transferring it from one to the other. Yep. So that process in it, in it itself, um, you know, is your first note and stuff. Was there anything as part of that process that you learned? Because for me, when I was trying to, you know, buy my first notes, I found um, a lot of education, understanding what goes on during the process. I'm just curious. Yeah, um, you know, I, I had I had talked to a, a bunch of people before about it, um, and you know, it was a it was a little frustrating the time that it takes to get it set up and get it moving, you know, um, for me. But um, it, it wasn't. I mean. Other than the time, it was relatively painless, to be honest. Um, and how long did it take, roughly? Um, I want to say it was about 45 days. Okay, yeah. So, again, you know, people, you know, because, you know, I've bought notes, I've sold notes, and people sometimes are like, um, you know, a week later, like, okay, is it boarded service? And I'm like, well, it's no, it's going to take you, you know, three, four, five weeks. It's not, yeah, happens overnight um, from right. that so um, I guess the one thing I didn't appreciate um, was that you know I, I this is a non-performing note that I'm putting with a servicer mm -hmm. I'm not collecting anything mm -hmm. but yet it's costing me $90 a month for that note yeah you know that you know that, for them to hold a non-performing note mm -hmm. so um, so you could, I know you could move it over to client service, which is, you know, 40 bucks. Right, right. Yeah, so. I wasn't aware of that at the time, to be honest, you know, <laughs> but that's one of the learnings, you know, there yeah. is that, that option to go to client yeah, service. It's understanding, you know, the servicers and, you know, sometimes, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of the different servicers. Um, you know, I've got a portfolio and I know you've got other notes and I'm sure you balance between different servicers. Um, mm -hmm certain ones because certain assets um, that might be performing, especially ones that are on like ACH and, um, you know, escrow, you know, one servicers, you know, 35 bucks a month, another one's at 18 or 1850, they're half the price. And it's like, okay, you know, the borrower's on ACH, the check coming out every month, you know, do it, why am I, you know, why am I paying this extra, um, you know, basically, you know, that's, you know, 250 bucks a, a year uh, almost in cost when you, all of a sudden you got 10 notes that's 2500 bucks i mean you can add up some real money um so that's one thing that 
um, is, you know, I think is part of a difference that um, I'm going to be talking about over next month is difference between, you know, have, you know, being a note investor and having a note business, because there is, I think, a big difference in that. Yeah. Yeah. You're right now where you pretty much, you know, got a note business because you've expanded and you've got a, how many assets you have under your management right now, Joe? Right now I've got uh, 24. Okay. So, and are they all performing or mixed? I have mixed. It's about, I actually kind of pivoted uh, towards the end of last year from non-performing to performing. Um, so I probably, I want to say I've probably got 20 performing and four non-performing. If you could get that damn seller to get you all that collateral, you'd be all set. <laughs> 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 some assets from me and you know I, you know we're laughing about it, but i'll tell you i had a hell of a time because i used a third-party company in getting all the documents to him and it was at a time like last october november where you know kind of every, you know basically this company just fell flat on their face and couldn't get you know all the uh, the documents and stuff and it's funny um because it, it just popped in my head um the uh, one asset which um, you know we converted from a CFD to a note actually uh, was um, the uh, the one of the companies they called sent me an email yesterday saying they're going in to record uh, record it today they uh, just needed one more document from me so um, that will <laughs> take care of one of them um, and then the other one I got to check on the status of but. Uh, you know, from getting, you know, documents and that's, you know, probably, you know, it's been a good lesson learned for both of us in that sense, because that was probably, the, you know, at the time for me, one, um, you know, the largest sale I've done um, of assets, you know, I've sold, you know, two, three assets at a time, but, you know, you bought, you know, more than a handful from me and getting that documentation, it was, I'll tell you, you know, it was painful. <laughs> and, you know, and I've, you know, and it was frustrating on my end as I know it was on yours because I'm trying to get you this stuff and, you know, all of a sudden stuff would show up and it was wrong or you get half of it. And it's like, you know, yeah. it's Mary and Joseph type thing. So. Well, I mean, I, I learned a lot too, because um, it, to be honest, it, it helped me put some systems in place because, you know, before if I was buying one or two notes, it, it's real easy to keep track of, you know, yep. you can kind of track it, but then, you know, when you buy five or 10 notes, all of a sudden, you know, okay, well, you, you get a collateral file, you get collateral files for seven of them. Yep. Okay. Now, which ones didn't I get those on? You know, <laughs> so, you know, I had to set up kind of a, a check sheet, basically, of all the steps that needed to be done. And I needed to track each one to make sure that, yes, you know, I got the collateral files, I got them set up with the servicer, you know, I've, I've got the new, uh, well, and, and I checked the collateral files to see, okay, was the last deed recorded properly, you know, to, from the seller. And uh, then if all that looks good, okay, now do we have a new one from the guy, the, the individual, like from you to me. And then, okay, we've got that. Now has it been recorded? Okay, no. And I don't, I don't, I actually use the service to do the recording. So then I have to send them to the service. And I need to track with those guys to make sure that it gets recorded and to get it back. And so uh, it's a whole a process that, you know, I learned I need to kind of set up and, and structure to make sure I end up with all the, the right files and, and stuff done. And that has been for me, uh, you know, one of my biggest challenges from going from, again, from just being investing in notes you know, hey, look, I know, you know, once you get through, okay, it's non-performing, okay, demand, or whatever your process is, managing the note actually becomes second nature and probably your easiest task. It's all the ancillary stuff of, you know, force place insurance, making sure it's that, or if the borrower gets insurance, canceling it. But, you know, the documentation, the recording and stuff, you know, it's funny, I was doing this yesterday. I'm at a call with my company I use going through all the assets because I still have probably, you know, 10 assets from last year. Uh, and again, we're in, where are we in April from last year that I bought that still don't have all the proper documentation recorded. And 
it's been challenging. One of the things I've done to change a little bit is you now I signed up for Simplify. I'll got my an account there. So I've been recording a lot of stuff I can do so that way I can control it. And then if something comes back rejected, I can go back to the seller and say, hey, fix this versus using the third party who then sends it to me, who I send it to them. And it's kind of like that example of having your servicer do the deed in lieu. They're like the middleman. Right. Something using these collateral companies. Um, you know, can, you know, be more headache. Um, but in certain instances where it's going to be walk-ins and stuff, I do have them handle it because I have no clue how much, you know, the check is going right. to be. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I've done, I've, I've tried that once, um, mm -hmm. recording one, uh, directly. And I think we, I went back and forth like three times with the County because, um, the check was, what was it? the check was uh, $2 off because the page count was wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, I had added another page with the, the stuff documents that I sent back. So the check had to, they needed a different check for the right amount mm -hmm. and all kinds of just little annoying things uh, that mm -hmm. had to be done, which is why I started using the you know, mm -hmm. servicer to do that recording. So um, mm -hmm. again, got to know your servicers. <laughs> It's, I mean, that's one of the things that, uh, you know, as part of, again, the business, it's knowing the strengths and weaknesses of your team. Uh, yeah, exactly. You well, know, it can create a lot more work for you. Um, and it's the difference sometimes of, hey, can I do this alone or do I need to bring on additional staff? Um, now for you yourself, you, you've got 24 assets. Um, you know, do you do it all yourself or do you have help? Um, I know you've got, you know, somebody, you got your servicers, you got collateral records, collateral, but managing the notes itself, is that just you? Right now it's just me. And, and yeah. I'm, you know, I've heard people say it before and I, and I think they're probably right. I think, you know, you, you probably start to get above 25 notes, something like that. You're probably going to need some help. You know, I, I have a little bit of help of some people doing doing some some marketing uh, mm -hmm. for me, but yeah. uh, as far as actual work on the notes, um, I do that all myself. I, you know, all the due diligence, all the you know, do the run the economics on them, all the mm -hmm. all the details. Which you know, I, I think you get more. You know, you're just going to get totally buried. I, do Do you have someone that helps you? Chris? So actually, I don't in the sense of, you know, I manage the business, but, you know, from the flip side, you know, I have, you know, a bookkeeper who does all my books, you know, I've got attorneys that handle basically everything I need to handle, you know, I rely on my servicers, but from a marketing and managing the day to day for the notes, um, that is me. And you now I'm kind of the, um, you know, that 20 note rule, I'm, I'm kind of like out there on my own little island because, you know, I've got about 200 right now. Yeah. Um, that, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, and I, I work with you um, well, so, but, you know, part of it is, for example, you know, I use a system called the Mortgage Office, which is the same system that Madison uses and Lake City Servicing and some of these other servicers. And I can put all the loans in there and I keep everything updated and it basically, I'm, very organized from my background and what you know my full-time career so from that perspective you know i spent you know all in on software just for that system between the funds and everything you know twenty thousand mm dollars -hmm. so but the reality is you know like with a fund you know you can hire companies that charge you like a thousand or fifteen hundred bucks a month to manage a lot of the fund for me i'd rather pay for the software because at the end of the day, after a year, basically it pays for itself. Um, it's a fund. You know, that's just one example where you know I say I do it myself, but I rely on you know like my books. My bookkeeper is I love Debbie to death, and you know I know a lot of people who do their own books, and they'll spend you know two three days a month doing all their books. And for me, you know, it's cheaper to pay her. Um, you know, a, a few thousand bucks per year per entity to, you know, get that done because it allows me more time to, you know, focus on what needs to be focused on. So, yeah, I have, I have a, a bookkeeper. I have an accountant that does my books as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
her name is Yuni Min and she's with Century Financial. Okay. She, um, she does a great job. She's really good to work with. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, she, the nice thing, I got introduced to her from some other note investors. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not all accountants have a good sense about notes and, and how to record to them and all that kind of stuff. And she- She's the one that's married to another investor? Pardon? Is she the one who's married to another investor? I don't know. Okay. There's, there's a one woman who's married to a, um, another note investor who does a lot of books and I can't think of her name right now. Um, and I don't want to mention the name, but, uh, you know, that's popped in my head, but. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, her name is, is Uni, yep. E U N I E men. Mm -hmm. Um, nice lady, great to work with. Um, you know, and, and she's not very expensive to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, uh, she's, she takes care of it and, and she knows all about notes and, you know, some of the slang that we use or, or that, it's unique to note investing, you know, uh, you know, the deed and lose, she knows what that is. I mean, she knows all the stuff. So, yeah. you know, it makes it real easy, you know, when, uh, you know, she starts recording all this stuff. So, uh, yeah. that's, that's, that's nice. Seen, I've been real happy with her. Yeah. So you mentioned marketing. I have seen a lot more, um, marketing from you coming out recently. Um, is your goal to try and expand business to bring in some investors to uh, participate in some of your deals or what's, uh, what's your long term? Yeah, um, my goal is to do that. Uh, right now, I, like I told you, I have a number of well, mostly performing notes. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually looking at um, selling partials. Uh, that was one of my next questions I was going to ask. Yes, yes, because I do have those. I'm looking at selling partials mm -hmm. from a, a a strategy perspective, mm -hmm. um, you know, what I would like to do is to um, sell the partials mm -hmm. and then with those funds, then be in a position uh, to invest in um, other notes as things, you know, as, as the market, you know, I think it's going to deteriorate further, unfortunately. Um, but again, I think it may be an opportunity to help some people out. So if you can get, get some notes at a decent price, you know, you can try to, turn them around, work them, that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, that's what kind of I'm looking at going forward, hoping to do. And, and I would be able to do that if I sell my partials and with the partials, people will get a decent return. Um, however, going back to my premise of, you know, I don't want to put anybody's investment in jeopardy because of where we are. I've decided to delay selling those partials because I want to make sure that the people that are making those payments now are able to make those for a couple more months. Cause with what's going on, a lot of people are out of jobs and et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. I've only had, I've only had one note investor, not note investor, one borrower mm -hmm. contact me regarding some help with their note. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have, uh, I have told my servicers, and uh, that if we're contacted people that have lost their job or whatever that, that want some help, um, the, the policy I've put in place is that um, first, I just want to see something that indicates that they have lost their job or they are out of work, you know, just, just something It doesn't, you know, mm -hmm. have to be a formal notice of dismissal or whatever, but just, just something to indicate mm -hmm. it. And if so, I'm willing to defer, up up to three months. I know a lot of people are only doing two, but I've said I'll defer up to three months um, and not make it all due at the end of three months. While like some people are doing, I'm actually going to move those three months to the end of the note. Okay. So um, I've told my two servicers if you get contacted, that's that's kind of the the plan. And uh, I've only had one so far. And like I said, what I want to do is I want to see those that demonstrate that they're you know still able to pay their notes through this time to me is going to be a really strong indicator that that would be a good partial to buy. I mean, if it was me and I saw that, I'd say, yeah, baby, I'll, I'd buy that because they made it through these tough times, you know, doesn't guarantee it hundred percent, but you know, it looks good. So that's kind of my strategy of what I'm doing going forward um, with, with those. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how May plays out because for me, uh, I've had two borrowers um, 
One of them was um, in bankruptcy, which they reached out to bankruptcy courts, which they had to provide the bankruptcy courts all the information which they provided, which they got a deferment on, which I'm perfectly fine with. The other one I've got was a borrower who had not paid since 2014. So I bought the loan um, last fall um, and the borrower hadn't paid in five plus years. And we've been, you know, trying to work with the borrower in some sense, because she wanted to keep the property. Um, but, you know, we also kicked off the legal. And then of course, with what's going on, um, has slowed that down. But um, she, you know, had been completely, you know, non-responsive and then made a phone call to the servicer asking for what type of forbearance we would be providing for this. And I, I kind of joked to the servicer, you know, that, um, you know, she, she should go play the lottery because, you know, last five years, she must've seen this coming or something. But uh, so, so on that one, unfortunately, um, you know, we, we didn't provide any type of forbearance. Um, you know, we still have offers on the table with the borrower for providing some type of reinstatement to keep the property and the borrower keeps saying, Oh yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. But you know, the way you know, saying you'll do it versus physically cutting a check or two different things. So um, you know, so, but, you know, May, you know, I'm curious to see how May will shake out, um, kind of back and forth a little bit because with, you know, the stimulus package of, you know, people getting 1200 plus dollars, you know, a lot of these loans are lower payments that I have of, you know, three, four, 500 bucks a month. So right. hopefully this might be beneficial for them. Um, but on the flip side, you know, there is, you know, lots of people who have lost their jobs. So, yeah, yeah, well, that's. That's tough. I mean, and you know, some of them are getting unemployment, which helps, you know, yep. um, and so that, that'll help carry them for a little while too. So, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. You know, I, I, uh, I wish, you know, I wish the best for everybody. I don't, you know, I don't want anybody to, to struggle, but uh, you know, unfortunately I think it's going to happen yep. um, or it already is happening. But, uh, I did, I did put together one, uh, one of the slide okay. um, and um, it, it's it's got kind of some of the oh shits I've seen okay <laughs> I was looking at a house in um, Memphis Tennessee and uh, I had gotten a bid accepted and I was doing my due diligence BPO mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff and I had the realtor do a drive-by mm -hmm. and I get a phone call uh, and I, I didn't get it. There was a message and it was the realtor saying, Joe, whatever you do, don't do the deal. Call mm -hmm. me back. I'm going, okay. So I called back, call him back. And she said, Joe, I just went by. There's no house there. It's a vacant lot. <laughs> I said, really? Cause you look at it on Google and you look at it on Zillow. There's a house there and it's the same house. But when she went by, there was nothing. Just two, two, two things I'll come on that is always take the satellite view over the street view because satellite views yes. are up to date. Second thing I'll mention is I've also got the opposite. I've gotten BPOs that say, you know, house needs no work, great condition, um, and it's worth 100000 and the house isn't even there. You know, the BPO, the You're real kidding. Really, wow. you know, um, and it's actually one in Texas. Um, it was in Houston. Um, wow. Uh, you know, um, it was on Cornelia Street in Houston where they said, yeah, three bedroom, one bath. And it's funny because there was like just a lawn chair sitting in the yard and you can see where the house was. And, you know, they did the BPO and I laughed and I got it. Um, so always check. Just don't look at the number on the BPO. Make sure you actually look at some of the photos. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what the realtor said. So, you know, as soon as I get back to the office, I'll send you the pictures. And yeah, sure enough, I mean, it's just a make a lot, you know. Another one, I, I had gotten a... Uh, an accepted offer on. Um, this one was in Louisiana. And uh, I said, hey, I wanna see the servicer notes. Uh, that's yep. something I've learned that's very helpful. Um, <laughs> and the yeah, servicer yeah. notes, mm -hmm. they, uh, they actually showed that the servicer had contacted the current note owner, um, mm -hmm. that the uh, city had condemned the property and required it to be demolished. And uh, the servicer sent the note to the, the note holder saying, you know, do you approve of having the city demolish it? And the notes there said, yes, we approve. So it's like, you know, 
what is going on here? You know, you're fixing to demolish the house and you're trying to sell the note, you know? It's, you know, and, and there's somebody out there, I guarantee you, that probably bought that without asking for the service of notes. Probably, you know. I, I've, uh, you know, I saw an asset recently that had a BPO of $80,000 on it. And I know an investor bought it. Um, and I had somebody go buy the property and the property basically, um, in the servicing notes, it noted that the property had a major water damage, was mold everywhere, the property was condemned. Um, I had somebody drive by, I mean, the place was a disaster. And, you know, they said, you know, it's worth probably about 5,000 bucks, you know, cause you have to have some stuff. And, you know, lo and behold, you know, somebody bought it. And I was like, you know, I, you know, somebody's going to take a bath on that because, you know, they didn't do their homework. Um, you know, and the reason I know they bought it was it was on a tape and the, the, the tape came out a few months later and it wasn't on there. So I was like, oh my God, did somebody actually buy that? So I Googled it and looked and there was a deed recorded into another entity who I know, I knew who the person was. And I was right. like, <laughs> uh, and then the, the the third one was I I put an offer on this property um, and it was accepted and I started doing my due diligence and uh, um, I had to actually had to hire an appraiser because um, I couldn't get a BPO done mm -hmm. um, there and so I sent an appraiser to do it uh, and he did he did that and then I started pulling the, the O and E stuff and I start looking and the person that's selling the note doesn't own the note. They're not on the CFD. Mm -hmm. And so I went back to them and I said, wait a minute, there's a problem here. You know, you're not on the CF, it was a CFD. You're not on the note on the quick claim deed. Um, it shows this other fund is. And so, they said, yeah, 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 but see, we're buying it from then and we're gonna turn around and sell it to you. And so I said, I tell you what, why don't you send me the quick claim deed showing that, at least, you know, even if it's not recorded, but just showing that it's been sold to you, you know, with the yeah. signatures. Um, I can understand, you know, recording takes time. And so, uh, so they sent me a quick claim deed from them to me that's obviously not recorded. Yeah. I said, wait a minute, guys. I, I need to make sure you are. And so now they're starting to press me to close on this and wire the funds. Mm -hmm. And they, they want me to wire the funds um, supposedly to a title company. And so I try to call the title company and, you know, most respectable title companies, you know, you're going to at, at, at least, you know, get an, get an operator or receptionist or somebody, you know, and you can kind of ask some information. I couldn't even get somebody to answer the phone. <laughs> and so... I said, guys, I'm not sending a dime until you're the owner, you know? And so ended up, they never could prove. I, I, I think it might've been some kind of a deal where they were just going to pass it through a whole bunch of them at once. And I, I don't know. I just wasn't, that, that, it just didn't sound right to me. So I ended up passing on it even after I spent all the money on the due diligence. Yeah, some, sometimes those are best thing. That's the best thing you could do. Yeah. 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 So, well, no, those are, those are some good, and we've all been through those. Um, so it's good to hear those as well um, and so forth. So Joe, if uh, people want to reach out to you, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Yeah, um, you, can, uh, you can reach me at uh, jkennedy at flyingloose.biz instead of com, it's B-I-Z. Okay. Um, and uh, I have a, a website, www.flyingmoose.com. Okay. And uh, also, you know, if anybody wants to reach out to me by phone, my number's 281-826-4354. Good. Well, uh, any final thoughts you'd want to add before uh, we wrap up this episode? No, I can't. I mean... I think that's most of them. I guess the only other final thought is that if you're, if you're interested in getting into note investing, um, you know, I can't, yeah, I, I can't reiterate how important it is to try to get connected with other note investors because what I've found is that 
you know, um, while I guess technically we all kind of competed against each other, but really everybody's very helpful. I mean, if there's issues or problems that you're encountering, other note investors have probably already encountered it and they can help you get through some of those things. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, I've, I've found it invaluable, you know, the connections and contacts I've made, you know, with you and, you know, people like Cody Cox and Dan Depp and, and, and uh, Paul Cooper and, you know, some, some different people like that, that, you know, are uh, really good to, to kind of have and, and work with. Yeah, no, I, I agree a hundred percent where, uh, you know, if, you know, you need help with something, feel free to ask. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the one thing that I'll caution people on is because I see it a lot on bigger pockets where somebody says, Hey, okay, I want to get into notes. I want to make $20,000 a month. How do I get there? Well, let's, you know, come on, <laughs> like, let's be realistic. Okay. Yeah. Ask the question of, Hey, what are some of the things I should focus on in my business plan? Because I want to get to $20,000. Um, in the next five years, you know, where, you know, what are some of the things I should be looking at? If you ask the intelligent questions and phrase it in that term, you get a lot further than just saying, Hey, I want to buy this note. What do you think? It's, you know, you you know, if you said, Hey, I'm looking in this note in Ohio or the CFD in Ohio, I know there's some quirky rules with CFDs and I've talked to somebody and, you know, what are some of the things that you, you've, you know, mentioned in the past or something, if you ask it in that phrase it in that way, you'll go a lot further. You have to show oh, yeah. some effort first before, right. you know, doing that. And that's where, um, you know, where I just caution people, but if you do it in that way, people, people are there to help. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's, it's a good community. Very helpful. People are very helpful. And, and, uh, you know, I've, I've learned a lot just by, by asking questions, you know, and stuff. So, uh, and thanks a lot to you, Chris. I mean, you've helped me as, as well, you know, with going through buying these notes from you. It's been a, a great learning experience. Um, Hopefully they stay performing for you. I hope so. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm encouraged so far, you know, it, it seems, seems to be doing well. So we'll, we'll see, you know, things happen, but, uh, I think it, it it should turn out all right. So yeah, you know, a big shout out to you and and and, and all the help from you. Um, you know, it's been good. Well, I'm gonna wrap up this episode of Note Invest, the Good Deeds Note Investing podcast. Uh, Joe, thanks for joining us today. And for people, make sure to check us out on YouTube um, at Seventy Investments, uh, our Facebook group, Notes and Bolts from the Good Deeds Note Investing podcast, and Thank you all for listening. Have a good day. Thanks everybody. for having me, Chris. Take care.